All right, thanks everybody for tuning in to the second in the series of Backcountry live streams with the Utah Avalanche Center. We are super excited to be here once again in Backcountry's headquarters in Park City, Utah. And tonight we've got a fun little talk on part two of getting the gear. What gear do you need? Why do you need it? And things you should think about before you head out in the backcountry. My name is Chad Brackelsberg. I'm the executive director of the Utah Avalanche Center. And my role at the Avalanche Center is to be in charge of all of our fundraising, education, and awareness programs. We're a partnership with the Forest Service and provide the forecasting and the awareness and education across the entire state of Utah. So we appreciate everybody tuning in tonight and uh, hopefully you will enjoy this as a part two and uh, get a little bit excited. At least here in Utah, we have a storm on our, foot, or on our doorstep and uh, this is a perfect time to get you thinking about what gear you need and why you might need it. So hopefully you did hear Jimmy's talk two days ago. That was uh, all about the Know Before You Go program. Know Before You Go is basic avalanche awareness. It is not an avalanche course. So it's not meant to take the place of going out and getting an on snow class. It's meant to really refresh your skills or be an introduction for those people who are brand new to the backcountry. Get your mind into the, into the right framework to start thinking about snow, avalanches and what you need to do to have a good season and to be safe all year round. So as a quick review from Tuesday, Know Before You Go is based on five simple points. So before you ever head out in the backcountry, make sure that you get the gear and that you get the training so that you know how to use that gear and how to travel safely in avalanche terrain. And then every day that you go out, make sure you get the forecast, get the picture and get out of harm's way. If you did miss the talk from Tuesday, you can go to kbyg.org and we have a full recording of that talk of the Know Before You Go program, or we have an e-learning course where you can go through and have interactive learning with test questions and quizzes to make sure that you are understanding the content. So today, as I mentioned, this is all about the gear. We're gonna talk about everything that we carry as avalanche professionals and reasons that you should, as a recreationalist, consider carrying that gear as well. It's not just about your essential avalanche rescue gear, which is your transceiver, your shovel, and your probe. It's also about a lot of other gear to make sure that you can perform first aid, to perform a, a companion self-rescue or that you can stay warm if you break a piece of gear or do have an injury because hypothermia is always a real threat when we're out there and not moving around. So remember a fourth of avalanche victims die in trauma and that if you're buried more than 20 minutes your chance of survival is less than 25 percent. So because of this it's absolutely critical that you carry this essential rescue gear and that you know how to use it and that you practice frequently. Avalanche professionals practice an hour to two hours every week with their rescue gear. So it's a great goal to have for everybody to make sure that they're spending a little bit of time every week practicing with their rescue gear. So remember, perfect practice makes perfect. So go through scenarios. Don't just go through the actions, but actually set up scenarios like they're real life. Having said that, you actually don't need snow for this. This is a great time of year. The powder fever is coming, but it's not quite there yet. So now's the time to get your beacon out, get out your gear, make sure it all works, and start to practice. There's no snow on the ground, at least yet in Park City, but I've been practicing with leaves in my backyard and in various locations like that. So there's no barrier to practicing of requiring snow. Also, make it fun. We always have bets going on, whether it's early in the season or when we're out in the back country, you know, we bet for beers at the trailhead or who's buying dinner at the bar, who does the dishes, who has to fold the laundry, you name it. You can make a game out of your practice. If you have kids, you can do the same with them. Get your kids out in the backyard with you. At a young age, you can start getting kids used to playing with their beacons. Treat it like an Easter egg hunt. Along with every beacon, hide a treat for the kids to make them motivated to work hard and try to find that as quickly as possible. There's beacon parks across Utah and most other states in the West. Find out where your beacon parks are located. 
They are usually free, and they're a great resource to practice some advanced skills. You can have multiple burial scenarios. You have to practice your probing, and it allows you to really do some things that you can't do just in your backyard. And most importantly, take a class. Avalanche rescue classes are offered through most avalanche providers. Those teach you not just these basic skills, but they'll teach you multiple burials, deep burials, what to do if somebody's beacon maybe isn't functioning, strategic shoveling, and different techniques to make sure that you are working quickly and efficiently during your rescue. So what is some of the gear, as we talked about? A shovel, a beacon, and we have some probes back here. So all beacons are generally the same. They all transmit a signal on 457 megahertz, and they all can receive on that channel. So you don't have to have the same beacon as your friends. They will all talk to one another. They work fairly simply. They emit a frequency that projects out. And everybody, when you turn on your, your transceiver, you're emitting that frequency. Think of it like your beacon is the center of an onion, and each onion shell is one of those frequency waves. When you do practice and you turn your beacon to receive, you are now picking up one of those layers of the onion. Just like an onion curved towards the center, these waves sent out by beacons are curved towards the, be towards the transmitting beacon. So when you are following a signal during a search, you're actually gonna follow a curved path towards that person. The key is follow your, follow your flux lines and follow your beacon, and that will lead you to the buried partner. Shovels are also important. Shovel blade is not as important as other pieces. A huge blade on a shovel with somebody who is a small or has less strength is less efficient than a properly say, sized blade. What is important is a telescoping handle. A short handle is inefficient, it's hard to move snow. So having a handle that you can actually telescope out and move a significant amount of snow is extremely important when you're looking at a shovel. The next best thing to look at or important thing to look at when you're looking at a shovel is what can you deploy the quickest and what can you use the best? Shovel handles vary in shape and size, and so those are the things to take into consideration. We have a few different probes in the back wall. Probes can be anything from aluminum to carbon fiber. They range from 240 to 320 centimeters in length, generally. Um, we usually recommend something that's 280 centimeters or longer. Again, find a probe that you can easily use practice deploying it, understand how it works, and, and take care of this gear. This gear is your lifeline. Don't just put it away wet at the end of the day. Don't leave it in your pack if you've been out on a snowy day. Actually take it out, dry out the gear. Use it frequently, make sure that it works, make sure that there's nothing wrong. Make sure that the shovel handle doesn't get bent so it no longer telescopes or no longer goes into the blade. Make sure that where your probe fits together, it doesn't get bent, or sometimes there's plastic sleeves in there that can break. So you need to make sure that all of that is still working frequently. So again, it's your lifeline, take care of it. Treat it like your life depends on it, because it does. Uh, that goes various parts. Beacons are electronic devices, just like your cell phone. Treat it as good as you would a brand new cell phone. In investigate the plastic parts, make sure you don't see moisture under the screen, Make sure there's no corrosion in your battery terminals, no signs of stress. A beacon is only good for about five years. Most people probably wouldn't consider using an iPhone 3 or 4, so consider that as you look at beacons as well. Can, all, all electronic devices do have a mean time to failure, so don't, don't expect that a, you buy a beacon once and use it for your entire life. So what else? What's some of the other critical pieces of gear? Um, you know, there's a lot of recommended gear. There's a lot of gear that um, we carry as well. You know, an airbag pack is a great example of a piece of gear that can be extremely beneficial. Airbags work to increase a person's size so that they are carried to the top of moving snow. Similar to a bag of chips, if you have a bag of chips and you shake it, the larger chips eventually move to the top, the smaller chips move to the bottom, but you can't shake that bag once and all the chips float to the top. So you do have to have a fairly decent amount of space for an airbag pack to work. 
And airbags work simply by having a mechanism. They're either a fan-based or a cartridge-based. And you can simply deploy it by pulling. And that's the basis of how airbags work. So they're great, they're good tools to have, but they're not perfect. They don't work in terrain traps very well. They don't work on short slides. So you can't guarantee that. You, your best advice is still to avoid avalanche train altogether. Some of the other things that we look at, uh, that we carry, um, a helmet, for, for me at least personally, a helmet's important. I ski a lot of trees. You're skiing through trees, you can brush a, a branch off the your, top of your head, it's no big thing. Or if you do fall, you have something to protect your head. I also like a helmet because if it is snowing out, your head, your head stays dry. Don't think about a helmet in terms of that resort helmet that you wear that's warm and padded and cozy. You'll just sweat too much. A lightweight, ski touring specific helmet breathes really well like a bike helmet and you, you can be worn actually on the uphill or downhill and you won't sweat or overheat with it. Um, some other things. Jimmy talked on Tuesday about the importance of slope angle. Clinometers can either be mechanical or analog like this or there's lots of great apps on your cell phone like Steve's Badass Clinometer that are great tools for learning to measure slope angle. Learning to measure slope angle is one of the best ways that you can stay safe in the backcountry. Avalanches typically don't occur on slopes of steeper than 28 to 30 degrees. So if you can keep your slope angles to lower than that, you can safely ski in the backcountry on most days. Other things that we carry, a map and compass. So GPS on your phone is great, but phones don't have great battery life when it's zero degrees or when it's cold outside. So it's really critical to learn how to use a map, know how to navigate with a compass, and know how to find where you are. So that if you do get lost and don't have phone, um, or have a dead battery on your phone, you can still find your way out. Um, some of the other things, um, warm clothes. So what happens if your buddy does have an accident? Maybe it's not an avalanche accident. Maybe you just fell and tweaked a knee. Maybe it's a more severe injury you're gonna get cold really fast. If your entire group is sitting in the snow trying to tend to a, a patient, everybody's gonna be shivering quickly. So at a bare minimum, you have a warm puffy jacket. It's great, maybe somebody got hurt. Maybe you just wanna stop and have a picnic during the day, throw on your puffy. An extra buff, I even usually carry two different buffs. They can be everything from a hat to a bandana. They're so functional that they really are helpful. And a warm pair of glove or mit gloves or mittens. You have my hands get wet pretty quickly, especially if I'm digging in the snow. So being able to put on a dry set of gloves is absolutely crucial for me. Um, first aid, if you do have that injury, do you have a first aid kit? Do you have first aid skills? Have you taken a first aid class? Just as important as practicing your avalanche rescue skills is practicing your first aid skills. It's absolutely crucial that you know how to perform some basic first aid. Um, after you've taken your avalanche class, we highly recommend taking a wilderness first aid or a wilderness first responder class. And part of that is, if you have an injury, can you perform a self-rescue? Do you have something like a rescue sled? It doesn't have to be something big and fancy like that. It can be just a series of webbing and straps that you can use to tie skis together to extricate an injured person but you need to be able to perform a self-rescue. You can't guarantee that a helicopter or search and rescue can get to you in a reasonable, reasonable amount of time. If it's 10 degrees below zero outside, you don't have a lot of time before your party will start going into hypothermia. So having a way to start a fire is critical. I love these little quick fire packets. They're tiny. You just light a corner, it drips down and starts um, your kindling or wood on fire. But it's amazing what a little bit of warmth can do to keep somebody who's injured in the rest of your party making good decisions and able to function. So part of that for me is also a thermos of tea. So even if somebody is shivering and starting to go into hypothermia, a little bit of warm liquid can go a long ways in bringing them back and keeping them from going farther into hypothermia. Um, other things, what about communication? You know, in a lot of places, 
There's good cell phone service, but a lot of places in the mountains don't have it. I love the new little um, InReach Mini. It weighs nothing, it ties to your phone, but if your phone goes dead, you can still use it. There's, with something this size, you have absolutely no reason not to be carrying it. Um, also, two-way radios. If you are in bigger terrain or trees, it's a great way to stay in touch with your party. It's super easy for people to get separated in trees, and having radios can uh, do a, a lot to save you from wondering, did my partner hit a tree and I need to go look for him, or did they just go left instead of right? Um, other things, goes back to staying warm. A little tiny emergency bivy sack. Um, yeah, I can, this is a full bivy, not just a space blanket. Again, it weighs nothing. It's in my pack all the time, and it can really do a lot more than just a space blanket. Since it goes around the body, it traps in that heat, and you can sit on this on top of a pack and really insulate that patient from it. Um, some of the other things, uh, a headlamp, in case, as I say, you get knighted. What happens if you end up in the wrong drainage and you come out at night? Having a little headlamp could be the difference between uh, really a needle in a haystack of trying to find your way out and being able to fi safely find that trailhead again. And then a repair kit. I don't carry a lot for a repair kit. I have a few, little, few other little things in this, but volet straps are one of my best friends. Whether you have a broken piece of gear, a skin that needs to be strapped on, whatever it might be, um, volet straps go a long ways. Duct tape isn't that functional in the winter, so I don't carry a lot. But what I do carry goes in my pack and not around my pole. Duct tape wrapped around a pole looks great, but it gets wet, it gets cold, then it warms up, and it usually doesn't stick real well. So I just wrap mine around a little piece of wood, and I stick it in my first aid kit or my repair kit, so I always have it. A little multi-tool and a Leatherman are the last two pieces. They allow me to screw a binding back on, fix a boot, whatever else I may need. Um, yeah, and then there's the geek side of us. So a lot of us, we are snow geeks, so we carry a little bit more. Um, we carry a snow saw so that we can dig pits and look at, at snow layers. Part of that is a cord to isolate those blocks. And then we have our, our snow kits as well, where we have everything from crystal cards to thermometers to our snow log where we're putting in our pits. Um, definitely not necessary, but it is something that really helps you understand the nature of snow. As you start to dig in the snow and you physically can feel and see these layers, you can isolate a block and you can actually have it fall off as you tap on it. it really starts to get you an understanding of what these weak layers are that cause avalanches. So yeah, that's a lot of what we carry. Um, and it depends on also where you're going. If you're going for multi-days, it's a lot more. If you're going to deeper terrain, you might carry more. But I always look at it as, if I am out there overnight, do I have what I need? So every good talk needs a Venn diagram. So I like to look at your ability to survive and enjoy a backcountry experience and to be safe is really in that sweet spot in the middle where your skills and experience your gear and your essential and required gear overlap. So really, you look at it as your essential gear, your beacon shovel probe, your recommended gear, everything else that keeps you comfortable, safe, warm, and able to perform first aid. And, it, and then your skills. The more skills you have, the more first aid skills you have, almost the less you need to carry. You don't see in my first aid kit a splint because I know that I have a shovel handle, I have a probe, I have stays in my pack, all of which can come out to make a splint. So as you gain more skills and experience with first aid, you actually can do more with less gear. So now, what's next? We've thrown out a lot of gear here. Well, the season's coming quickly. It's time to go down to your gear closet, brush the dust off everything, make sure you took the batteries out of your beacon last fall, so put new ones in. If you didn't take the beacons out last spring, open up the compartment, make sure that you don't have any corrosion or from the batteries over the summer. Make sure your beacon works. Make sure your shovel deploys. Make sure your probe deploys. Look through everything else you carry and start talking with your ski partners of, do I have the right things? What should we have? 
Maybe not everybody has to carry a snow saw in your party. Not everybody has to carry a first aid kit. But making sure that everybody in your party has some pieces of this gear is really essential. Then what's next? Have you signed up for a class yet? As I mentioned before, if not, kbyg.org has the entire Know Before You Go online learning program. There's six hours of free education on there. Well, we don't quite have enough snow for our on-snow classes yet, so what else? Well, there's a lot of other online resources out there. Solomon, Ortovox, Mountain Sense, all these have great online tutorials. Or you could go old school and buy a book. Staying Alive in Avalanche Terrain is one of the classic books for really learning some avalanche skills. It is a great refresher. A lot of us read it every single fall just to pick up what we might have, what might be a little rusty in our heads. Well, avalanche classes are selling out quickly. So if you've not taken an introduction to avalanches, a level one, a level two, or an avalanche rescue course, I would get out on the sites of your local avalanche center or education provider as soon as possible and start trying to book a class because they are filling up very quickly across the whole US. And so if you want to take one, you need to be thinking about that right now. What about a first aid class? Maybe you've already taken a level one. Maybe you should then look at a wilderness first aid or wilderness first responder classes. In those classes, you're really going to learn how to assess injuries and then how to package up a patient and get them out safely to a trailhead. Then what? Well, as I said, practice, practice, practice. Now is the time to get the batteries in your beacon, turn it on, pull out a six pack of beer, go in the backyard with your buddies and start practicing those skills. Because before you know it, we're all gonna be on snow, we're all gonna be more focused on skiing powder than practicing these skills. So doing that now means that when there is snow on the ground, you're not worried about practicing those skills. You've got that part dialed and you can go shred some great powder. So hopefully this has all helped. We have part three of this series coming up next Tuesday. Um, where Craig Gordon, one of the Utah Avalanche Center forecasters, is going to give you a full preseason tune-up and really uh, take you to the next step beyond the gear. So hopefully you enjoyed this. If you have questions, you can always contact the Utah Avalanche Center for more details. And uh, hopefully you'll tune in next Tuesday to hear Craig and uh, take it to the next level. So thank you all very much. Thanks, Backcountry, for hosting this. And I wish you all a safe and happy winter.